Um, uh, roughly seven minutes, right? Six. I think you're both doing it one after the other, so yeah, yeah. Five minutes, wonderful. All right, five minutes, and um, let's go from uh, that side. You're first. Let's do it. A round of applause. Guys, that's a Steam Deck. That's awesome. I actually. Here we go. Oh. Doing the microphone. All right. Uh, hi, I go by Luma. I maintain the uh, Godot asset pipeline and uh, import system. So, uh, up along with uh, quite a few other people, including. Uh, but yeah, basically, uh, uh, the. All right, what to talk about? All right, so. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk about is the Godot humanoid uh, animation import. So Godot, since 4.0, has a cool system called, uh, called the skeleton profile, yep, which, yeah, shows up, right which shows up in the import dialog. So I wanted to show this visually so that you can, uh, this is, th all right. Um, <laughs> okay, I got a little bit late in my demo here. Let's start over. All right. so. Um, I have here an example character, which I've imported from a Unity package. I'll get to that later. Um, basically, uh, this thing is a FBX file originally, but we converted to GLTF, and it's right here. So if I open the advanced importer dialog, how many of you have actually double-clicked or clicked the advanced button in the import dialog? Show of hands. Uh, that's a pretty good, pretty good number of people have discovered that. That's great. Um, this is actually a very important dialog. So if you haven't actually tried double-clicking a uh, model file or clicking the advanced button in the import doc, which I'll show as well, um, it's it's worth doing. Uh, here's the other way to get to it. There you go. Advanced. All right. So what's in here? Let's take a look at some of these things. So there's some really cool stuff in here. All right. Well, the one I'm going to cover first is the skeleton. So skeleton um, has this really cool property here. If you get a new GLTF file in your project, it'll look something like this. Um, you probably It's a very innocuous thing, but there's actually really good documentation pages on this subject of retargeting. Um, if you go here and you say new bone map, and you actually click on it, and then again go here and say new Skeleton Profile Humanoid. You have to do both of those steps right now. It's a little opaque if you haven't read the docs. But if you do both of these things, um, it will attempt to auto-assign the different joints for the various parts of the body. Um, you can see here it actually did not detect the shoulder correctly. So oh, that's not the shoulder. Let's try again. Uh, so if we assign all the joints, I'll skip over this for the rest of it, but I just wanted to show how it works. Um, here's a shoulder, it's spelled a bit weird. Um, and you basically repeat that for each joint. Usually Godot does a really good job of detecting it. This is actually one of the first models I've seen where it didn't. Sorry about that. Um, but I'm going to cancel out of that because it's already been assigned. Um, but yeah, basically you assign the bow map, you assign the profile, everything's assigned correctly, you re-import the model, goes like that. It looks like nothing's changed, right? Let's go make a, uh, it froze, oh no. Um, it does look like it's frozen, all right. Um, but yeah, basically what you can do with this is, <laughs> all right, uh, I know just a couple minutes, I have like one minute left probably. Um, one minute 30. All right. Backup project. I already have it open. All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, this is actually a VRM model, which is a humanoid. It's a GLTF extension that automates the assigning of bone mappings and some other things. It creates what it changes your skeleton 3D node to general skeleton, assigns the uh, bone names to be standard. And what you can do with this is you can actually uh, go to your animation player 
you can load an animation. I don't think I have one in this project, sorry. But if you saw in the other project, the flossing, that was actually a unity.anim file, which I've imported with my project unit.importer. And unit.importer will convert your Unity assets into Godot assets um, into native Godot formats, like GLTF, T-Scene, dot t res for animations and so on. And so you can load any humanoid animation on any humanoid character as long as you go through that uh, advanced import dialog and assign a profile on the skeleton. How many minutes do I have left? 30 seconds. 30 seconds. All right. On the import dialog, there's a lot of other cool things. Um, I'll double click this real quick if it loads in the next 30 seconds. Um, there are also options for animation player tracks. You can go assign, you can extract things to file. Really important button on the top left, extract materials. Really good workflow, reminds you of Godot 3.2. And you can assign collision, generate physics on your various meshes and choose to decompose to convex hull. And that's all the time I have, thank you. Oh, very good. That's fantastic. Wow. Incredibly impressive. For oh, that's amazing. Hats off. Hats off. Okay, uh, we got one from that side. Let's go from the other side. Who here is ready for a talk? A person with a topic. Yeah. Okay, let's do it. Okay, everyone. All right, so I wanted to talk about, or I was, I got to talk about handling data in Godot. So uh, in general, there, there's multiple ways to go about it. One way that I've seen done a few times in projects is you have a JSON file and it just has like the data in it. And there's a very simple JSON class with which you can load this into a dictionary and then just uh, get fields out of it. But that's a bit limiting, of course, because, well, you, you have to know what you have to write in the file and you have to parse it by hand and all that, like figure out w which fields to put where. So the nicer way to do that is with resources. So you already all have worked with resources probably, even if you don't know. It's stuff like meshes or images or whatever. And uh, you can create your own resource class, basically, by just inheriting from it. And in there, you can just export any fields you want. Uh, and they show up in the, uh, OK, wait, no. So you create your own resource class, and you give it whatever fields you want. And then in the uh, file system, you can create your own, like an instance of this resource. So you can basically say, OK, uh, I made a class for an ability. And then you can go in the file system, uh, create a new ability instance, and then in the inspector you can go and fill like whatever fields you want. So it's a pretty nice way to visually edit your data. And you can of course do the same nested, like you can have a resource that has an array of other resources in it and stuff like that. And the editor does it pretty nicely, at least since 4.0. There was a lot of improvements in this area. And uh, one thing that's very important to know there is how resources get loaded, since Godot by default caches all resources in a global thing. So in order, to, like for example, let's say you loaded an ability file and you edited something about it in your code. Then all other instances of this resource, when you load it, will also have changed because of the caching. So if, to avoid that, um, you can either duplicate the resource or you can um, use the local to scene option, which uh, has been kind of broken. I worked on fixing one of the bugs. It's not merged yet, but uh, at least you can look forward to that getting finally fixed. Uh, but yeah, it's a kind of a weird system. But basically, if you use resources in nodes or, and then instantiate them in multiple scenes, they get duplicated automatically. That's what that option does. All right. Right. Oh, wait. We still have two minutes, and I have a question. <laughs> um, how would you, well, so you recommended resources. How would you work with a larger data set? So let's say that you, you, you plan on having 2,000 resources for kinds of attack. How would you go about that one? Uh, so I, I would say that you, since you can uh, 
kind of nest resources inside of each other, you can probably uh, not, you don't have 2,000 files basically is what I'm going to say. Uh, and also, uh, this is also something I wanted to say but I kind of forgot to mention, uh, since resources are also text-based, it's very nice for Git. Like you would say, okay, maybe JSON is better because, oh, it's, uh, it's all text-based, but no, resources are the exact same, so it's also very nice to work with them. Uh, but I would say for larger data amounts, it would probably be up to uh, like kind of nesting them inside of each other. All right. Thank you. All right. Peeps. Uh, so. Okay. Thank you very much. And we're moving on. Who is ready? Someone? Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's go. Start with your topic and, um, yeah, best of luck. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Here we go. Me. I'll find it. Okay, cool, thanks. So, let me put my phone. Right. Yes, now we're ready. Okay, so the topic I was going to talk about is web multiplayer on the browser. So you can just click and play the game with your friends in the browser. So everything works smooth in the Godot 4 with the notes and the, with notes, but it doesn't work with multiplayer on the web because notes are always well. Notes work with without um, web socket, so it's just the local nodes. The web works only with nodes with 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 websocket sorry i'm just first time yeah so we need websocket but it it works but the browser says that we need security websocket and this means that we need to create the certificate then well it's easy to create the, to create the, to create the certificate Though we need the website because the certificate only can link with the website. So we need to buy the domain name, then create the website on that domain, then create an Apache server on that domain name, and then link the certificate to that website, to that Apache server. And then it will let us use this WebSocket server. So I have created this actually procedure and uploaded that on GitHub. So yes, I put the code code on the table because, well, I don't have the PC to visualize that. If you're interested, you can scan. And yes, I have my own website. It's called www.games.info where you can click and play. So it works on each that I O too. The main problem, of course, was to create the certificate. Any questions? Uh, yeah. Okay. No, I, I actually have also, um, oh, sorry, I actually have a case to share and techniques to share with uh, multiplayer web. Can I? Well, we still have time, two and a half minutes. I can do it. Okay, okay. okay cool. Yes? yes. But question please, also, if okay. anyone has. Okay, no questions, no. solved. So, uh, two minutes. Sorry, does it work? One, two, one, two? No. I can go Hi. without. Okay. Hello, hello. Okay. Yeah, so uh, my name is Tiago. Me and my friend Daniel, we have many years of uh, experience in infrastructure and um, high scalability uh, software. And we actually have a open source tool for your web uh, multiplayer games, uh, WebSocket more specifically. Also a tool, competitor. No, just kidding. <laughs> Check out his tool as well. Uh, but yeah, but our tool is more specifically for you that are using Agones. Who has ever heard about Agones here? You. So you also heard about Kubernetes, right? So yeah, so you, if you are using Kubernetes and Agones, um, our open source project is a controller that will watch all of your game servers and you don't need to worry about certificates, URLs, uh, DNS, anything. 
it will just watch uh, all of them. And as they scale, so if you have a surge in users or if you need to bring up more uh, game servers, um, it will create automatically all of the ingress rules and the URL so you can um, use them as well. Check out our uh, project in GitHub. It's um, <laughs> github.com uh, slash uh, octops. And yes, that's it. Questions? Anyone have a question? All right. Applause. <laughs> In terms of, in terms of, ah, listen, here we go. In terms of time, we're rocking it. Okay, next person who's ready for a talk, yeah? Okay, let's go. Oh, there. Here you are. Hey there. Um, first of all, disclaimer, I, um, my background is in political science, so I'm, I'm very much a hobbyist. <laughs> but uh, I, I did make a game in Godot, and I exported it to the web, and it had the multiplayer. And I, I tried many different approaches. Most of them were wrong. So I'm kind of here to share this uh, newfound knowledge and uh, pain I had. Um, so there's kind of, I, I would say there's kind of two main ways you can go about it. So one is you use, uh, what I uh, did first was to use Nakama. I saw you know, their sponsor and seems like a really nice uh, support for Godot. Um, it's highly scalable if you can pay for it. Uh, it start, they have a managed service. It starts, I think, at $600 a month, something like that. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, if you don't want to pay that, means you, you know, of course, it's open source, so you can just kind of manage your own server. However, that comes with some complications. You need to, you know, manage your own server. Um, and it has, it has both relayed multiplayer and uh, authoritative uh, multiplayer. It has like a Lua runtime plus a few other runtimes. Um, I don't remember exactly. Plenty of features, friends, whatever. You can do whatever you want with it. However, um, um, I, I, I didn't go for this for a number of reasons that, that I will explain. Um, it, is, it works out of the box with, uh, uh, with web export um, if you don't need HTTPS. If you need HTTPS, which might be a consideration if, for example, you're incorporating your game into another web page that uses HTTPS, then everything needs to be HTTPS, right? Uh, in that case, you need to put a load balancer in front of your server that has uh, an SSL certificate. And I did it, it's just a, a bit of a headache uh, to manage. Uh, it it kind of works, but I don't know. For me, it was just, I needed something more simple. So the way I went about it is, since I'm using Godot 4, and it has a great new multiplayer API, and I'm hoping I'm running out of time. Uh, so it's, um, the way I, I went about it is, uh, so I wanted to have the same code base for my game and for the server. Uh, that just makes development so much faster. Um, and, and so what you can do in, uh, in uh, Godot 4 is, is um, you can basically just have some ifs. Uh, you can make an authoritative uh, game and just have some like if statements. And if um, uh, is server, then do this, this, and that thing. And, and then what you can do is when you want to um, create a multiplayer match, uh, there are some services, uh, I'm going to talk about one of them, which basically will, will spin up a server for you, a Godot instance running your game um, in a Docker uh, container. And then you just, it gives you an address, a port, you just connect to it, and that's your game server. So you have the same code base, you don't even need a different project, it works super fast, uh, it's pretty great. Um, and uh, however, for, uh, it has also an API, a community API, uh, Hathor HTTP, if you go on, the, uh, on asset lib. However, for some reason, it doesn't work on the web for me. I need to check. It's probably something to do with certificates again, uh, something like that. Uh, but that's the way I would go about it. So just don't, don't uh, make really complicated servers and so on. Just use the, the Godot multiplayer API, and it's, it's the fastest way to prototype your game, in my, in my experience. Um, so... Yeah, Hatora, I don't, I don't work for them. I don't know why I'm advertising them, but um, it has $500 in free credits, which is plenty. It's highly scalable. You can do millions of concurrent matches. They, they showed some, some experiments with that, and it's, it seems a pretty good service. Um, and also, two more things I just want to remind you to. One is uh, Godot has a really uh, neat feature where if you have a, a web export preset, uh, you, you, you can click on the top right, and it will, uh, it will start like a 
a web server for you, and you can just preview your game really quickly in Google Chrome or whatever you use. Um, and um, there's also, if you want to show, one minute, okay. If you want to show your game to, to your friends really quickly, what you can do is you can export your uh, HTML file, put it on Netlif uh, Netlify drop, and instantaneously it's on the web and you can, you can let other people play it. Uh, yeah, that's it. Questions? <laughs> Can you, f um, for the first method you explained, can you use that for something like an open world game where the world shouldn't be deleted on the player disconnecting? Um, can you can you separate the server from the from this client in that? Case? So you're talking about persistence, basically. Yeah. 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 Uh, with Nakama, I'm almost sure you can do it. Uh, with the the second one, you it basically generates a new server every time. So you, you would need to have some other service that, uh, then of course you can run code on your server that downloads data from somewhere else, uh, but you could do it in both, both methods, I think, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we're keeping this nice and swift. Who's ready to go next? We've got a couple more topics, I remember, ah, ah, yep. Wonderful. All right. Yeah. There's HDMI. HDMI. So close. We could do the, oh, there we go. Okay, there we go. It was a bit of a okay. tease, wasn't it? Yes. Okay. Right. Okay. Five minutes. So five minutes from straight away. So WebRTC, it's a very interesting protocol, um, which works peer to peer. This is the documentation on the Godot website, and uh, it's sort of like a replacement for WebSocket, but it works in browsers. People, a lot of networking pro. Um, talks here. Now, if you go down here, you get the little diagram of it, which uh, is really misleading because it makes it look like the signaling server is like a supercomputer, and then the two things here are, are, uh, are, are, are like uh, little, little minor things. And it took quite, me, uh, quite a while to work out that the actual signaling server is, all it's doing is this. You know, when you get um, a Zoom call and someone has to email you this ridiculous link here with loads of characters and stuff in it. That's, and, and that has to be emailed to each side and then we can all click on that and then connect to each other directly. That's all signaling is, is we need to move this piece of text across. Um, if you go and look on the um, demos in the uh, demo projects, you really don't get any, you get a sort of a signaling example using uh, web sockets or something, but it's really crude. And what I found is, so we step to the other side, what I'm actually using is I found that there's a protocol here called uh, Mosquito, which I've used quite a lot in some IoT projects, uh, such as uh, you, you would just have these little tiny devices, you can attach a temperature sensor, and they have even their little low power, a bit of Python on it, they, they, can, they can start operating um, and spitting out lots of data onto the web. Uh, web. Anyway, let's just hit, hit return there. And you can see a whole bunch of data that's coming from uh, roughly my hack space, things telling you how, lot, how the coffee machine and various different temperature sensors. It's just <laughs> spitting out stuff, right? Um, and if we just go to one, that's, one that I've subscribed to a different channel, um, and then you can see all I do is I, is I make, uh, I go hi there, and there it is, shows up, hi there, yeah? So that's all it is, and so that's then enough. Once I implemented the uh, Mosquito client into GD script, which wasn't a big deal because if it can run on those little controllers, it can run in, in Godot script. And that way I managed to then connect up. So it might be interesting to see it. We've got, we've got the two things and we connect uh, one as server. And you can see it started sort of advertising as the server through that network. And on the other side, um, it says it's client, and then it starts handshaking through all the various different bits of text or stuff, a bit like the Zoom call link, and you get 
uh, it's, it's now networked, the two pieces. And if you were to download this and stick it on your phone, it would work that peer-to-peer. Uh, -peer. So it looks like we can now do the whole uh, networking over WebRTC. Uh, this will also work from browsers, and you don't need Nakama or any of these external servers. All you need is this uh, very standard protocol here, the Mosquito Protocol, and uh, that's enough to bootstrap the whole process. And uh, yeah, that's it. Right. Um, the question was, do you have the example on GitHub? And yes. also? Yes. Uh, yes. It would be even nicer if I could put it in the demo projects. But yes, it is, it is all. It all I, I've been trying to simplify it. It runs all the other three, two protocols, ENET and WebSocket, also through it. But uh, it's sort of like just a workbench. Yeah. Oh, hello. Yeah, it's just a workbench. So uh, yeah, uh, find me. What? Where can I get it? Where can we get it? <laughs> <laughs> Where can we get it? Okay, whoops. Oh. Where can we get it? <laughs> GitHub. Up, go to Church Prime. And then repositories. And then Was there another question? Yes. Oh? Okay. There so there. Right here. We don't yeah. see it. Not sharing the screen. No. <laughs> Thirty seconds. Okay. <laughs> it's done this before, hasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it's out there in the internet. Twenty. <laughs> Ten. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Made it just on time. Church Prime, could own multiplayer network and workbench. And you can see the little dialogue. There we are. There we are. Okay. Call me anytime. Yeah. Right. We just ran out of oh. we just ran out of time. Five minutes. We've got to have a system. All right, we're ready for the next person. Let's do it. Come on. First time I see a System76 laptop. Impressive. First the Steam Deck, <laughs> and then this. Uh... Thank you. Yeah, it's a real hardware rarity right here. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Tom. I uh, work in research, mostly on programming tools. And what I'm going to show you is a really rough prototype, which maybe you have some feedback on, or maybe um, inspires something that you want to do yourself. So what we asked ourselves was, um, how can we make prototyping rough ideas quicker? And what came out of it is Pronto. Um, so I'm just going to launch um, the game here real quick. And you can see it's just like a tiny little game. I have this character who can apparently kill this enemy and collect coins. And um, if we actually look at the scene, you saw that the little enemy guy here was just moving to the right, right? And let's see how this is composed of. We have this node over here, which is actually a node, a custom one, an always behavior, which will always do a thing. And it has a connection. It always moves right. What is moves right? It is a method of the move behavior, which in turn is a child of this enemy character body. And that is how you compose logic in the system. You put in behaviors into your scene, connect them to one another, such that you never have to switch to the um, scripting tab anymore. So let's um, briefly look in here. This is just the Godot signal, the standard signal that we all know connected to a connection of the move behavior. So if I just delete this in here, you can see all the different things that this um, move behavior understands. So I can just change this to move left, start the game again, and we should see the little enemy guy fall off the screen rather quickly. Another cool thing about it is that um, we are exposing a lot of variables here for you um, automatically. And so you can see my jump height right now is not too impressive. So let's bump that up a little bit while in the game. And there you go. 
these um, values are all exposed um, since the idea is kind of that you're prototyping, so you want to iterate on these things quickly. And so you can designate them as um, values of interest um, by having these little pins that um, set certain values here. One more cool thing I want to show you here real quick is that actually um, um, you can see the connections flashing here now. This is whenever they're triggering. So let's look at the logic for the uh, coin spawning. You can see they uh, trigger just about every um, second. Um, so let's reduce that and we should also see the flashing go quick, all right? And over here you can also see the collision um, code triggering whenever my character wins on to collect some coins. Um, are we in time? Oh, okay, perfect. Now I have time to talk about one other cool thing I find. Um, we tried this out with a couple of students and uh, you want quick feedback, right? So what do you do? You don't necessarily um, put your laptop there everywhere. You'd rather have people pull up their phones uh, or something. So what we integrated was a, um, a single push deploy idea. Um, those of you who have used CI continuous integration before have probably heard this before. So um, the workflow here is that uh, really all you have to do is give your game a name, then build your little prototype and push. And once uh, the pipeline has run through, it will appear on our little website here, ready for you to play it. So um, there's actually some really cool um, things that our students built, um, like a little geometry dash clone, for instance. And yeah, as you know, Godot runs on the web, so this is really all that is needed for the students to have a live version of their game um, ready to run. I, I'm actually terrible at the game, but I'm told you can beat it. At least the creators of the game managed to beat it once, and they'd actually have it on camera, so I am inclined to believe them that it was actually legit. Um, but yeah. Okay, um, any questions? Um, how did you get uh, the arrows to flash in the editor when you play the game? Um, there's the, uh, does anyone have the name ready? Um, the um, debug, uh, there's a protocol for it. Uh, it's really straightforward, really just um, the game tells the engine, hey, there's a uh, message that I would like to send back to the engine, and then you can catch that via plugin. Uh, how does the build and upload process looks like? Mm -hmm. um, you can use, in this case, GitHub Actions. Um, uh, actually, I'm just going to pull up the project. You can talk to me or just look at the repository. Um, it's a bit finicky to get right, but once it's done, it usually um, stays done, which is nice. <laughs> yeah, so um, it's in here, and the um, interesting part for you would be in the GitHub Workflows folder. Hello, um, I really like the idea. I actually used something similar with my last uh, game jam, like a behavior-based thing. Um, how do you like manage the problem? Like I had the problem that like stuff gets really overwhelming. Like we got like a lot of nodes and mm -hmm. in the end I had the feeling we had like a state machine kind of going on. Um, how, how would you go about like that problem that stuff gets like really, I don't know, messy? Yeah, that's um, so. I have two answers. One is a cop out. The other one might be legit. <laughs> this is designed for little prototypes, so we don't have complexity. <laughs> um, the second one is we uh, gradually introduced more and more powerful behaviors. For instance, a proper state machine, and we also have some things that reduce visual complexity, such as um, these automatic grouping nodes that help you stay uh, um, on top of the complexity of your scene. All right, um, who has not done their topic yet? Hands up, one, and that is everyone, or uh, anyone? All right, your turn. This is your moment to you know, plug your game and uh, make everyone wishlist it and download it. <laughs> Hello everyone, um, my name is Mark, and I did not a uh, game, and I did not publish it. Um, however, <laughs> my friend here, um, Roger, he did it, um, and he actually did it in six months. Uh, so please, some <laughs> applause for him. Godot, you've seen it. Um, so he recently created his small studio um, himself, and uh, I think it was six months ago uh, he started the project, maybe seven months ago, and uh, he was able to um, 
do the whole thing and publish it with the publisher uh, in that time. So uh, I think it's quite impressive. Um, he got help with um, some the art from another guy. I don't remember the name, but he will uh, probably tell it afterwards. Um, and I can share my experience and how he lived that. Uh, <laughs> Because I've said uh, we're friends for a long time since we were kids, and uh, yeah, like maybe it was uh, two years ago. He was not uh, really into coding at all, and I think Godot really helped here. Uh, it's like super approachable, it's like a really good engine for that, and I think it should be more like um, used in the uh, education. I would say. Um, so yeah, really proud of him. Hey, hello. Uh, sorry for my English. I'm, I have my translator. So, <laughs> um, my own experience in in this project it was really hard. Uh, I don't. I'm not a programmer or something like that. I'm a game designer. I'm a jam game designer. So when appeared this opportunity to make a game and get paid for this, um, it was like oh. I never think about this. Uh, and I don't know what I have to explain because you um, you take the paper, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's a journey of a solo dev with launching like a title. Okay, so it was hard. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I've never... <laughs> the... I, I think it's, it's worth uh, mentioning that uh, he started uh, um, doing uh, jumps, only jumps, for over and over, one after the, uh, after the other, um, receiving a lot of feedback from people trying to improve uh, some things here and there. Um, so maybe if you are considering doing that, you should do that too. Yeah, please make jumps. It's the best thing in the world. Uh, the Godot Wheel Jam is one of the best in the world, so you can do it. Um, <laughs> What I think about, uh, yeah, the, if someone is interested about make a game alone and trying to publish, the first part is take friends, uh, <laughs> make friends to help him, because there's a, a lot of times that you can do all, so you need people to help us, to help you, or. Uh, a community with a lot of plugins that you made and we and help us help us no help me help i don't know okay so nothing uh, i don't know um please play the game it's a really nice game but did but you did you mention the name of the game uh, no <laughs> <laughs> it's a hundred steps you can <laughs> Um, I don't know. M uh, maybe it will be a good time for um, questions. Yeah. <laughs> oh, here we go. Oh, no. How do you make friends? <laughs> <laughs> I, I can answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly, um, <laughs> mostly being uh, as kids a lot of time, um, a lot of time that makes friendship, regardless of how incompatible are you. Uh, go for that and drink beer. <laughs> since you didn't have sorry, since you didn't have any coding experience before that, how did you approach learning how to code? Oh, uh, I learn with a lot of tutorials in YouTube and making a lot of game jams. Uh, I spend like three, three years, uh, one jam per month, more or less. And <laughs> in the last one, hola, hola. Yes. <laughs> in the last one, I ap appear a publisher and say, Hey, I have money, and you have, and you know how to make games. We can make a deal. So, um, tutorials in internet and practicing a lot and break your mind and crying and. <laughs> <laughs> We're out of time. Thank you very much. Okay.
Thank you. All right, the lightning talks are done. Everyone, thank you so much for participating, for being here, for enjoying it. It, it looked like it was uh, truly worthwhile. So enjoy the evening and uh, we'll see you tomorrow.